The spring games are done. The spring practices are done. I want you to give the, the most important thing. There's always a handful of storylines, but the most important thing you've taken away from each team. Let's start with the East, and let's start with Michigan State, since I mentioned Mark D'Antonio. To me, Connor Cook, I'm torn. Because on the one hand, I go, he's had two great games, and people are you know ready to say he's the next great one. And then the flip side is, those games were great against great teams in big-time spotlight games, the Rose Bowl and the Big Ten Championship game. They were at the end of the year. It's not like he's not on an upward slant, and he seems to have progressed even more throughout the season in terms of confidence and accuracy, et cetera. So to me, that seems like a big storyline. It is a big storyline, and you may have him underrated if I hear you right. I mean, I, I think he is really a good player. And again, I get to see spring practice. You usually just get to see the spring game. The day I, I, We don't need to compare who's better or worse than what they get to see. I, the day I was at spring practice, I, he, he was really impressive. But, but you know, Mark D'Antonio says after the spring game, Mike, he says, uh, Lisa Byington said, what about Connor Cook's development? Mark D'Antonio says, I have always said he could be a great, and he said great, running quarterback. Right. And, and so that took me aback a little bit. But when you, look at, when you look at Connor Cook and Damian Terry, who I thought had a really good game. Now, Damian Terry has the reputation of being a dual-threat quarterback. Connor Cook doesn't. And yet, Connor Cook runs well, and Damian Terry passes well. So they're never going to be a spread team. But I wouldn't be surprised if this Michigan State team evolved offensively. So I think that's one story. The second story is you go to practice again, and you, you, you'd watch the defense – and you watch Pat Narduzzi and the defensive staff, you just swore they never stopped anybody. I mean, they are hungry. They're, they get after their defensive players. Uh, schedule's really good. They're yeah. obviously one of the best teams in the conference and obviously one of the best teams in the East. By, by the way, not to undersell that point about Cook, I mean, D'Antonio a month ago, I remember telling me, he was like, I think he can get 80, 85, 90 yards a game rushing. That's a, that that is a that's an unbelievable drastic departure yeah. that they, that they would go to. And remember, Mark D'Antonio is a defensive coach by trade, and he understands how difficult it is to contain a quarterback, whether it's in the pass game or the run game, who can move his feet. And that's probably where he's coming from because he's seeing how they have to defend all these spreads. Speaking of defense, let's turn our attention to Ohio State. The big thing to take away from their spring, to me it might be, I've all of a sudden been hit in the face with that D-line has an awful lot of weapons. Noah Spence was really good last year. Adolphus Washington is there. They're going to have some real players on that line. Deepest defensive line in the conference, and, and Nebraska has a really good first defensive line. So who has the best defensive line? I'm not sure, but Ohio State has the deepest. How about the offensive development of Ohio State? Braxton Miller's hurt, so that gives Jones and Barrett a chance to compete for the second position. That's big time. The other thing that jumped out at me with Ohio State is they don't have the downhill presence yet that they had with Carlos Hyde. Huh. And uh, when you talk to Urban and, and, and Tom Herman about their offense, they said we're a spread team, but we're a downhill spread team. Our shoulders are parallel to the line of scrimmage when we give the ball to tailback. Defense, everybody knows Ohio State's not going to win the national championship until they play better defense. The head coach is in the meetings longer, uh, more. The, the staff has changed and the scheme has changed. So I think they get better on defense for those reasons, not just because they want to get better. They get better because the staff has changed, Urban's always in the meeting, and they've copied some of what Michigan State does mm -hmm. defensively. And to wrap up what you said about the QBs, Braxton being injured was a problem last year, but they had a very capable backup ready to go in Kenny Guyton. So him not playing this spring, like you said, is kind of good because it lets those two guys behind him – uh, TJ and Cardell or JT and Cardell get a chance to get reps and help them be ready if they do have to fill in this fall. Without Kenny Guyton, uh, no Ohio way they're State, undefeated. That's correct. No and, way they're and undefeated. And so that you're right. So they've got to get in that same position now. If, if you ask the coaches, you'd still rather have uh, Braxton at practice right. because you can always think you can get the second team guys reps. But you, there's a silver lining in Braxton being injured. Let's turn to Penn State. Uh, off the field, the recruiting news every week is great and staying great for Penn State. On the field, it seems to me depth is going to be their most glaring problem on this team and maybe most notably on the offensive line, I would think. Offensive line and linebackers, both are serious depth issues. But I'm glad you brought up recruiting because, you know, it's unfair to categorize James Franklin as a great recruiter and not mention that he's really an outstanding coach. Again, I go back to my practice experience. Probably one of the most aggressive 
physical practices I saw all spring in, in the Big Ten. So he, he's got it together recruiting, and he also has it together uh, on the field. Uh, the other thing he's got to do is Christian Hackenberg is his best talent, probably one of the best talents in college football. He has to devise an offensive scheme that makes him the best player. They, they don't always intersect. And hmm. so it'll be interesting to see how the offense evolves and they go back to recruiting. I, I'd suggest to you that – both times I was there, I probably saw over 120 prospects on campus <laughs> in the two days. It, it won't be long be before Penn State challenges Ohio State for the most talented yeah. team in the East. And yet they lose a talented guy in Allen Robinson. Can they find someone to catch the ball from Hackenberg will be a big question, too. Big question. And so how do they tweak the offense? You know, they could line up in the spread some, and then that's a that's a double-edged sword. You ever get Christian Hackenberg hurt on a, on a decide right. play? So their offensive coaches are really going to be challenged. Mentioned the O-line could be a problem for Penn State. Turn our attention to Michigan. I don't know. I'm curious your thoughts. I don't know if it's a problem or just still a big question mark offensive line for the Wolverines after spring. I think it's still a question mark, but, but I do believe they have the talent. L listen to these numbers, Mike. Nine of their 16 signees were mid-semester transfers. So nine of this year's class. They have 78 of their 85 scholarships at spring practice. That's more than Penn State will have in the fall. Hmm. So they are still a very young team. Nine seniors total, seven true seniors, two red shirt seniors, only one senior on offense, Devin Gardner. Defensive staff, no one is coaching the same position on their defense of staff as they coached last year. The same coaches, but they've reorganized them. I would say to you, uh, Doug Nussmeyer, uh, they fired a very good coach in Al Borges. They hired a very good coach in Doug Nussmeyer, but a different style coach. Doug coaches more, everybody on the field. He's brought some youth and some enthusiasm to the offense. And I, I, I think that the offense always reflects the personality of the coordinator, i.e. Pat Narduzzi at, Penn, at, at Michigan State. Uh, look good. Uh, Hard to get a handle on what happened last year because we watched them last year in the spring and then they couldn't control a line of scrimmage against Akron by way of example. Maybe it was leadership, maybe it was a chemistry thing. So I think that leadership and chemistry may be very important to this Michigan team this year. Quickly, Morris Gardner, your thoughts on any QB battle that would be there? No, I don't, I don't think there's it's any battle. Devin's. It's Devin Gardner okay. for sure. Indiana, offense has not been a problem for them. Defense has been. This is a unit that gave up 38 points a game last year, and it seems from all accounts that it doesn't seem to be just like that fixed right now after spring. Well, you watch Kevin Wilson call plays and you watch his offense, you know he's not afraid of gambles and risks. Well, he's, he's taken a gamble and a risk on defense. He's, he's changed the scheme from a four-man front, meaning four defensive linemen and three linebackers, to a three-man front, meaning three, line, three down linemen and four linebackers. Uh, you know, that's a big gamble in the fourth year of your program. On the day we were there, I didn't, ha I didn't see anything that made me think automatically they were going to get better defensively just by changing schemes. I think there's more pressure under defensive lineman in the 30 defense than there is in the 40 defense. The, the offense looked very good today that Howard and I were there. Schedule, I don't like their schedule. I've been very vocal about this. At Missouri is not smart. At Bowling Green is not smart. East division, obviously tough. Crossovers, Purdue and Iowa. You know, Purdue they match up with. Iowa is one of the best teams in the West. So they could have a better team than some other teams if they're not eligible. Uh, eligibility for a team like Indiana has a lot to do with mm. your schedule until yeah. you're established. Let's turn to Maryland. Everyone's sort of starting from scratch. This is the new team. What Maryland hopes is that they're not starting from scratch in the wide receivers because Stephon Diggs is the real deal. Remember on signing day a couple years back, Ohio State almost had him, but he ended up going to Maryland. He's played great. He gets injured in the same game that Deion Long gets injured. Those two have to be healthy and playing in all 12 games if they've got a shot. No doubt, and they were both injured the day that, that we were at practice, and so we didn't really get a good feel for them. But Maryland's a lot like the, the Big Ten teams that are presently trying to get bowl eligible. They're a lot like the Big Ten teams that went to some of the minor bowls. That's what their roster looks like. Randy Etzel is a veteran guy. You know, you just you watch him on the field. You watch him in meetings. He, he's been through this before. He's been a head coach at UConn. He took them from an FCS program to a, to a BCS Bowl. He knows exactly what he wants. Offensively, Mike Loxley of Illinois mm -hmm. uh, is the offensive coordinator, but it looks like they're mixing in the spread and, and some pro stuff. Uh, defense, they're a typical four-man front, run the, the typical coverages. Uh, schedule, East is a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big problem. Crossover. Iowa, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's a Non-conference, South Florida, 
West Virginia, Syracuse. So both, and I know we're going to get to Rutgers here, both Rutgers and Maryland, you, you better figure out your non-conference really quick. They're not, if they were in the West, it would be a little different. But to be in the East and play that kind of non-conference schedule, right. That's tough duty. You mentioned Rutgers, about 30 seconds left. I was there this weekend. To me, the takeaways were on offense. Janarian Grant is their kick returner. They're using him at wide out. He was effective. Desmond Peoples was maybe the star of the spring game, and he's their backup running back. And Gary Nova, to me, seemed like the clear-cut front runner to be the starter yet again, as he was for the majority of last year. Yeah, I saw Nova practice. He obviously has a lot of experience, and I know you watched him a lot closer than I did Saturday. So it looks like he's, he's probably the guy. Uh, Rutgers is in the same situation. Their skill is better than their than their line of scrimmage, and that's where they're going to have to go as they move forward in the Big Ten. Schedule, crossovers, Nebraska, Wisconsin. So you're in the Eastern Division, and you play two of the better teams in the West. Non-conference, Washington State, Navy, Tulane. I don't like any of those. There's a stretch in their schedule. Michigan, Ohio State, Nebraska, Oof. Wisconsin. That's rat-a-tat-tat-tat. That, that's a tough go. But, you know, but, again, you can compare Rutgers to most of the Big Ten schools that right. are not playing on an elite level, are not going to the Capital One Bowl, not going to BCS Bowl games. So they fit nicely. They have the same challenges Indiana, Purdue, Northwestern, Minnesota, Illinois, all those teams have.